Hello and welcome to The Local Campaign. I'm Cynthia Mulligan, political specialist for City News. On October 19th, Canada will elect the 42nd Parliament and Rogers TV is the only station producing debates of all of Toronto's 25 ridings. For the next hour, you will hear from the candidates of Beaches East York. But before I introduce you to the candidates, let's take a closer look at the riding of Beaches East York. The riding of Beaches East York stretches from Lake Ontario in the south up to Sunrise Avenue and the Don River's eastern branch to the north. The eastern border is Victoria Park Avenue and the western edge is Coxwell Avenue. Neighbourhoods in this riding include a portion of the former borough of East York and the beach. Stan Wadlow Park near Cosburn and Woodbine Avenues is located in this riding, as is Malvern Collegiate. Toronto East General Hospital and the Ludi Lifeguard Station on Kew Beach. NDP member Matthew Kelway is the incumbent MP in this riding. And I must say that I am actually a resident in this riding before we get underway. Now I will give each candidate one minute to make their on opening statement and this will be done in the order of most seats in the party, uh, by the party in the House of Commons. And we will begin with Bill Burroughs. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you to your viewers for letting us into your home. My name is Bill Burroughs. I've lived in the riding for over 18 years. I've been involved in uh, community groups like the Q Beach Neighborhood Association. I've been the president of the Q Beach Daycare and I've also been involved uh, in healthcare with the uh, Flemington Health Center as a board of director there. Uh, I've worked with friends and, and neighbors and community members of all political stripes and colors on issues ranging from daycare, healthcare, infrastructure renewal, flooding issues, all sorts of issues that matter to the residents uh, in the riding. My background is Greek with some Irish, that's where I get my last name Burroughs. However, I am fluent in Greek and uh, immigrated to to Canada from South Africa with my family when I was nine years old. I'm an entrepreneur and uh, I'm, I've uh, uh, run my own business. I've been in the technology and the manufacturing sector my entire life. I know what it takes to create jobs and to employ people and that's what I bring to the riding of Beaches East York. Thank you very much. Our next candidate is Matthew Kelway, who is the NDP incumbent in this riding. Thanks, Cynthia. <coughs> this weekend I ran into a mother and her daughter. She said, my daughter wants to be mayor. Any advice? I said, yes, serve your community. Politics ought to be about putting yourself at the service of others, not pursuing your own. And if somebody, someday, you find that uh, you can be of best service by running for public office, then go for it. That's why I ran. That's how I serve. That's why I'm running again. Because, as the old saying goes, fish rots from their head, and there's a lot that's been rotten about Ottawa for a long time. It's about transit, housing, childcare, and jobs. It's about seniors, their pensions, their health care, and now mail delivery. My promise in 2011 and again today was to bring these issues to the forefront of the national agenda. As urban affairs, infrastructure, and deputy transport critic, I did that. And now my party, the NDP, has an urban platform for cities across this country, including ours. It promises to build fairer, sustainable cities with a prosperity more equally shared. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have Nathaniel, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. Great, thanks Cynthia. This riding is my home. I grew up here. I went to Beaumont and Malvern. I played baseball at Ted Reeve and Stan Wadlow. My parents are local teachers and, and I now live here with my wife Amy. Uh, I'm here to be a strong advocate for my home riding. I'm a commercial litigation lawyer by trade. I practice uh, at a firm downtown, regularly go to court. I studied politics and constitutional law at Queen's University and the University of Oxford uh, for eight years. I I've won public interest cases at the Divisional Court and Human Rights Tribunal. I previously volunteered for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. I'm here to build a better government, one that is smart, one that is fair, and one that is honest. Uh, my grandfather, when I first got involved in politics, said, no one wants to hear what the other guy hasn't done. They want to hear what you want to do. And I can't wait to answer questions tonight and explain how we're going to build that smarter, fair, and more honest government. All right, thank you. And next we have Randall Sack. Hi, I'm the, Green Party, I'm the Green Party candidate in Beaches East York, 
And I used to live in beaches about 35 years ago, and um, I did a number of things since then. I uh, have worked in the co-op housing and social housing sector in Canada. I managed, uh, in Toronto, I managed uh, three housing co-ops in Toronto, two homeless shelters. So I'm aware of the plights of the poor and the marginalized in our society. I then took that experience and, and got a master's degree in international affairs and did international development work in a variety of countries for a lot of different organizations, ending up working for the government of Canada, most recently in Afghanistan and Vietnam. So that's a bit about me. But you should vote green because we were the first party to release um, our platform and a fully costed budget. It's a balanced budget. And we promise a lot of things, and we're doing that by uh, repurposing money. And I'll get into that, I hope, a little bit later. Thank you. Next, we have Roger Carter. Roger Carter of the Marxist Leninist Party of Canada. We say stop paying the rich, increase funding for social programs. We also believe in accountability. We believe in uh, that the ordinary citizens should be the real decision makers all across Canada. I've worked uh, at uh, 969 Eastern Avenue as a postal worker. I retired nine years ago. I'm very concerned with the whole question of pensions. Uh, but above all, uh, uh, when uh, you take more out of the economy than you put into it, uh, somebody gets exploited at the end of the day. So that's totally wrong. We need to change all that. We need a new, new constitution which puts uh, people at the center of decision making in Canada. We should take it away from the big corporations. So we need to make very serious changes like that. So a whole new constitution uh, for people's empowerment is what is required in Canada. Thank you. James Thank you. Sears. My name's James Sears. You already know who I am. Why are we murdering people in foreign countries, spending tens of millions of dollars a year murdering their children in Palestine, in Ukraine, in Syria, instead of spending the money here in Canada? We have seniors and veterans sitting at home eating cat food on limited budgets. They can't afford to pay their rent. It's a choice between eating or paying their rent. The four major parties, at least the three of the four major parties, support Israel no matter what Israel does, no matter what atrocities they commit. The middle class would gladly pay taxes if they knew it was going to help poor people, not to murder people in foreign countries. I'm sick and tired of our money being used to advance the interests of the United States and Israel. I stand here as the only person who has the courage to speak out for our people, and I'm going to do it loudly and clearly tonight. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We will now begin our question and answer period of the debate, and each candidate will be given 30 seconds to respond, followed by discussion. I'm going to bring up child care first. Beaches East York is known for having many families, many with young <coughs> children, and child care is a crucial issue for them. It's expensive. A daycare spot can cost over $1,200, $1,400 a month. Uh, it's often the price of a second mortgage on a home. The universal child care benefit was created to help give families uh, parental choice as well as a little bit of a break, but it doesn't come nearly close enough to covering costs of daycare, nor does it create daycare spaces. What would you do? Should, should the government be in the daycare industry? Should it create a Quebec-style kind of child care system. I'm going to start with you, Bill Burroughs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been working in the child care uh, area with uh, the, the Q Beach daycare. We were tasked with having to sort of uh, implement for the daycare the Liberals' uh, provincial policy on child care. Let me start by saying that that was a disaster. Uh, parents alike and, and uh, staff people there alike all recognized all the problems. It was implemented very hastily. Um, I can expand on that a little bit later uh, when the questions come back to me. All right, Matthew Kelly, we're just going to go this in this direction. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, father of three, former daycare board member, uh, myself, and dare I say you understate the cost of daycare <coughs> these days. If you have an infant in uh, child care, it's, it's over $2,000 a month. So our plan is to create a million regulated quality health care spaces across this country. It's a promise that's been made since 1971 by successive liberal and conservative governments. We will finally get that done. It is really the extension of the Quebec 
uh, plan uh, writ large taken across the country for up to $15 a day. Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. So our plan is the Canada Child Benefit, and both my friends, uh, Mr. Calway and Mr. Burroughs, support the Universal Child Care Benefit. We're going to cancel checks that go to upper income families, redirect all checks to families that really need the help. And the Library of Parliament has found that our plan will bring 315,000 kids out of poverty. And they're not just going to help kids who are between the ages of one to three that you would typically send to daycare. They will help kids all the way from zero to uh, the age of 17. Uh, it's about choice, and I should say, just a, a final, as part of our social infrastructure plan, we will create thousands of childcare spaces as well. Nathaniel Sack. Randall. Randall, Randall I'm yes. so sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. You look alike, don't yes. you? <laughs> Well, not that much alike. <laughs> I, I think I've got a few years on you, Daniel. One or two. Uh, yeah. Um, well, child care is a provincial responsibility, and we would work, the Greens would work with the provinces on the type of child care um, programs that they want in those provinces. Uh, we don't believe in a one size fits all, so we're not going to take the Quebec uh, program and write it large, as, uh, as Matthew has said. Uh, so we do believe in doing that, but I've run out of time. Yeah. I was going to give you a couple extra oh. seconds there, but we'll come back to you okay. when we open our, the floor for debate. Roger Carter. Universal free uh, uh, child care right, right across the board. So uh, like uh, give it to everybody, you know, for all, all children, there should not be any discrimination. Universal free child care right across the board. That's the responsibility of all the governments. James Sears. Absolutely not. No free child care. The only reason women are working is because in 1974, Pierre Elliott Trudeau gave away control of the Bank of Canada and destroyed the economy. And now two people have to work in each family. If we can improve the economy, then you only need one breadwinner in the family. The way we improve the economy is we take control of the Bank of Canada. Please Google the lawsuit of Rocco Galati against the Bank of Canada. We are suing the Bank of Canada. You are. You may not even be aware of it because there's a media blackout. Thank you. I'm going to open up the floor now. Yes. Well, Cynthia, I, I want to uh, let everybody know that our party is the only one with a plan to actually create spaces. All you have to do is go to the Eastland Farmers Market uh, any week during the summer, and that um, park is covered with strollers and blankets and toddlers. And it's been well documented that we have a boomlet out in our uh, baby boomlet out in our riding. And so what, what parents need is access to child care, uh, quite apart from the affordability uh, issue. And so it is our plan, in fact, to create new spaces to make access possible for parents. But who's paying for it? That, this is the question. Because in the end, the taxpayers are paying for it. It's not just who's paying for it, it's when are they going to be created. I mean, this is a promise. You're, Mr. Kelly is asking you to elect an NDP government, not just this time, but in succession the next time and the time after that. That it's about helping parents now. And as I said, our plan will bring 315,000 kids out of poverty next year, not eight years from now. And, and I also have a serious question about existing spaces versus the creation of new spaces. I, I, I've now seen Mr. Mulcair say uh, it's not just about creating a million new spaces, it's about maintaining spaces as well. So we have to be very clear about what the promise is. Cynthia, I'd like to just interject for one second here and suggest or, or to, to bring to the viewers' attention that the Liberals implemented a child care policy provincially and they did it very quickly, knee-jerk reaction so that they could get re-elected. They didn't put any thought, any plans into, into that and it was a disaster to implement it and it's still a problem for daycares to deal with that. The NDP on the other hand are suggesting something that even my colleague from the Liberals has recognized is going to take years and years and years to implement if it ever happens. It's a pipe dream. You need all the provinces to ratify that. It's not going to happen. Our party is the only one that's taken solid steps to at least make it more affordable affordable for parents. We've increased the universal child care benefit. Anyone that has a child under the age of six receives almost $2,000 a year. Any child from the age of seven to 17 is getting $900, or sorry, $720. In addition to that, we're doing income splitting. We're also increasing the TS, uh, TFSA. We're making it more affordable for families and for people with children. So right. our plan is the only one that's actually in motion, that's affecting parents today that's giving them money and making it more affordable. Both these plans are not going to work. Why, why universal? Why the universal nature of the child care benefit? And I would ask you both, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Burroughs, why make it universal? Why not means test 
it, uh, the National Child Benefit is means tested. That's a fair way of approaching it. And, and why should a family that makes $500,000 or a million dollars, why should they re receive a government benefit? This, this is a false issue, Nathaniel, and you know it. It's a taxable benefit, and so those who make high incomes, it gets taxed back. But we, in our riding, have one of Toronto's seven neighborhoods where there's more than 45% of the kids living below the poverty line. For the parents that receive that, that is very meaningful money. It puts food on the table so kids can have breakfast before they go to school, and it's got that value. And I think you also need to pull the issue of child care, accessibility, having spaces apart from the child poverty issue. And our commitment under the child poverty issue is to take the CEO uh, tax loophole, stock option tax loophole, and close it and dollar for dollar turn those dollars against child poverty in Canada. Let I me ask though, you do Absolutely. need the province's support and a lot of the burden, the financial burden will be on the provinces to create this national child care. How are you going to get all the provinces on board? Well, we'll do it the same way that we have to do it uh, across the board on all sorts of issues. There is permeable uh, jurisdiction in this country now in just about every issue from the environment to child care and what we need is a government that's finally going to take national leadership, sit down with provinces and begin to work out how to lead this country to a better future. Child care is part of that discussion. And I would add that here in Ontario, we had the provincial Liberals stand up and support an Ontario NDP motion in the uh, legislature um, for our national child care plan for up to $15 a day. I'd also like to point out that this is a good economic plan. In Quebec, 70,000 women went out to work when they brought this their child care proposal into that province. And we've had economists look at this program and talk about the economic multipliers. For every dollar that's invested in child care in this country, it creates a dollar seventy to two dollars of economic activity. It's a good economic program. It's a good social program. It gives parents who are at home with kids because they can't afford child care the opportunity to go out and make a living. It, it, it gives some yeah. parents an opportunity to do that. Yeah. It, 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 again, it goes back to the universal nature of the program. You talk about taxing it back as if 100% is going to be taxed back. No, 40 some, you know, 40 some odd percent may well be taxed back. It's still giving a benefit to families that don't need the help. And when you talk about the universal nature of the daycare system, the evidence in Quebec says the same thing, that the top 25% income, of income earners access that system without need. You're not creating availability for women You're to enter the workforce. I, ha I have They're a point. already entering the workforce. I have a point is, that people yeah, yeah, want the benefit want. now, they're getting the money now, and they get taxed on it based on what they, what they make. Just as my colleague, uh, Mr. Kelway, suggested over here, the money goes out to each and every single family with children, and then Revenue Canada collects those taxes, and that's how it's determined who gets the benefit. But why do we say child poverty? Yeah. It's family poverty. Like, I'm sick of this. This is typical Marxist uh, speak. Children don't live on their own. They live in family units, okay? The state does not own the children. There's no such thing as child poverty. And I'm sick of people using that expression. It's family poverty. Thank That's you. why the Conservative uh, like Party to has put together a plan here. where uh, we're may, giving may families $2,000. May I speak $2, for, for $2, one minute, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, listen, the, the big corporations have enough money, you know, like if they paid their fair share of taxes, there'd be enough money for, uh, for child care. Not only that, but there's also foreign tax accounts. I mean foreign uh, bank accounts where money's earned in Canada but taken completely out of the Canadian economy, which I think is a crime in itself. True. That money should, uh, can go and should go to, uh, to affordable universal child care. You know Randall, what I think is, I'm going sorry, to let sorry, Randall interject here. Speak, gentlemen, please. Um, yeah, um, Bill, it's good you're putting money in people's pockets, but it's not enough. To, I mean, maybe they can buy a few weeks of daycare with that, but it's, it's just not enough money. So the, it's obvious to me there needs to be a better system. The Greens believe in, in universal child care and will work towards that, but we want to do it in a different way. We would like to explore um, workplaces actually having places for children so that they can be close to their parents that work. So we'll work with private industry, we're going to work with provincial governments, we'll work with municipal governments, but we want a system that works. And the only way to make that work is to make sure that all parties involved are, are involved in making the decisions and deciding on a system that will work for them. 
I, Macy? Oh, so I'm going to let Bill's been cut off sure. a couple of times. Sorry. Let's Go let ahead, him Bill. have a word here. I, I think the interesting thing here is to, you know, really put it in the hands of the voters. I, I mean, at this point, we're all here talking about what's best for the voters. And quite frankly, what we've done is we've put money in the pockets of the voters. We've, we've provided tax relief through the income splitting. Uh, we've, we've provided a whole bunch of measures that have put money directly into the pockets of parents today and into the pockets of families and seniors today so that they can make the decisions for themselves. Everybody on this panel is trying to suggest that they know how they would spend that money better than the people at home. And I think that on October the 19th, if people uh, really give it some thought and, and consider what's at stake here, they'll recognize that what all of these parties are talking about is taking that away from you and making the decisions for you. Matthew, I'm going to let you have the final say and then we're going to move on to our next topic. Thank you, Cynthia. I think both Liberals and Conservatives understate uh, the, the challenge of paying for child care in, in this city but also right across the country. The, the Conservative plan was never an actual child care plan. It doesn't provide the options available. Nathaniel's attack on the un universalism of our program really understates and misunderstands the challenges for even middle income families uh, to pay for child care uh, these days. All right. The next topic this evening is transportation infrastructure. We have seen, particularly in Beaches East York, the debate over the Gardner East, which will have a huge impact on our ward. There is no doubt our transit is woefully underfunded and needs multiple billions of dollars across the country, but especially in Toronto as well. James, I'm going to start with you. What do you think needs to be done for transit and how would you fund it? As I mentioned before, there's a lawsuit to take back control of the Bank of Canada. Up until 1974, the Bank of Canada could lend money to the municipalities and the provinces at 0% interest for infrastructure projects. I'm the only candidate talking about this. Look up how Pierre Elliott Trudeau gave up control of the Bank of Canada in the lawsuit. If we win that lawsuit, then if the City of Toronto wants to build a subway expansion, uh, then what they do is they ask for a 0% loan from a Bank of Canada that we the people own. That's the only solution. All right, thank you. Roger. Yeah, well, basically this, this is the problem that ordinary citizens are shut out of all major decision making in Canada. That, that's totally wrong. So uh, even a question like infrastructure and transportation and so on like that, that should also be in the hands of ordinary people, ordinary citizens. Right now, just corporations and their representatives make all the decisions in Canada. That's totally wrong. So, I mean, this is very applicable to this question, too, of infrastructure and transportation and so on like that. So ordinary citizens should be the real decision makers even on something as fundamental as oh, that. That's time, thank you. Randall. Yeah, um, yeah this is an incredibly important issue, uh, not just in this riding or this city, but across the country. Our infrastructure is crumbling. You just have to go out on any street and see all the potholes. You have to, if you take public transit, it's very crowded. Uh, it doesn't work very well. Our rail system, our intercity rail system is in terrible shape. So the Greens would like to build high-speed trains in the Toronto-Montreal-Ottawa corridor as, as a start. We'd like to invest money to increase and improve public transit. Public transit is one of the most important ways of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. And so. I apologize, our clock is jammed, but that was oh. your 30 seconds. So okay. I'm just going to have to tell you when your 30 seconds are up. Thank All you very right. much. And we will open the floor for discussion on this. Well. Nathaniel. So everyone will agree that public transit in Toronto needs to be improved. Uh, congestion in the GTA economy costs over $6 billion every year and across the country we have a major infrastructure deficit. That's the deficit we should be worried about. My friends in the NDP and Conservatives have said balance budgets no matter what and we're saying the return on investment we're going to get from investing in public transit uh, more than exceeds the small borrowing costs which on 10-year bonds are less than 2%. We're going to spend an additional $20 billion on public transit specifically over the next 10 years and we're going to spend more money on public transit than, than my friends uh, from the NDP and the Conservatives. Matthew. Well, that's not true. Um, but let me say that it's more, it's, it's not just about gridlock, it is about the nature of Canada these days. And we are an urban nation, and our party is the only one uh, to recognize that. And we can't have a national agenda with, that isn't also an urban agenda. 
And so the NDP's platform uh, has a, a huge urban component to it, and it's about a dedicated public transit fund for $1.3 billion a year that goes out 20 years. It's about an increased transfer of the gas tax to cities of an, of an extra $1.5 billion going out in perpetuity because of the nature of that. And it's also about retaining the Build Canada fund That's time. that the Conservatives have All put right. in. Yes. Bill. Thank you for that introduction, Matthew. Um, <laughs> the Conservatives have introduced $80 billion infrastructure investment in Canada, the largest this country has ever seen. We're investing $13 billion of that in Ontario and over $2.6 billion in smart tracks alone for the GTA and the benefit of all the folks that live in the GTA. I'll mention that and I'll also tell you that we've done this by providing you a balanced budget, um, a balanced approach to this, and without raising your taxes. And that's the key here compared to the other proposals that you're hearing from everybody else. Everyone else is saying, well, we're going to invest more. $80 billion, that's a lot of money, and, and we're doing that without raising your taxes. That's time. I'm going to open up the floor now. Every time I listen to Bill that, uh, or the Conservatives, that number gets higher, so I'm not <laughs> sure how the accounting is getting, is getting done there. Uh, but what uh, the Liberals fail to understand is that what cities need in this country is long-term, predictable, and also substantial funding. And their, their funding mechanism is simply too short. It is not good enough for cities to say, oh, there's money on the table for 10 years. Cities need to know that there is a stream there that goes out into the future that's predictable so that they can borrow against it for capital costs. Why doesn't the NDP support the lawsuit against the Bank of Canada where we could get our bank control bank back and have zero percent interest loans to the municipalities and the provinces. Could you please answer that? Well, this isn't about loans. This is about transfers from the federal government. It's about a recognition that we have a national interest in our city. Well, what's a transfer? And we went, through, we went through the Liberals in the 1990s where they cut and slashed and downloaded all of these issues onto our city. So now our cities get 8% of the tax dollar and responsible for 60% of infrastructure in this country. And yet our uh, economy uh, and the 80% of people live in cities. Uh, and so what we need to recognize is that the federal government has a responsibility for our cities, for making sure that exactly they're fair, right. sustainable places. Exactly and right. And ensuring that there is funding and coming and from the federal government to support the economies the and social life in our but cities. But it's our tax Nathaniel, what do you have to say to the criticism that the liberal funding for transit starts off but then starts diminishing? So, it's, so it starts off, so to be clear, this is additional money over, the Conservatives have proposed $65 billion in infrastructure spending over the next 10 years. We're effectively doubling that to $120 billion, uh, 100, sorry, $125 billion. Now, when my friend says that that's not true about uh, the amount of money, additional money is we're putting in, it's $1.7 billion additional monies for public transit specifically next year, 1.7 billion the following year, and 1.3 billion fo the following year and the following year. That's uh, collectively about six, uh, uh, six billion dollars in the first four years of the mandate. That is more money than what the NDP is proposing. No, it, you, you, you Mr. Kelway, the you next throw year- throw everything into infrastructure. You call housing infrastructure, it, you call senior Mr. housing Kel infrastructure, you call a bank infrastructure, you call childcare infrastructure, and that's how you get to this glorious hundred and twenty billion dollars. That's actually incorrect. It's actually incorrect. And if incorrect. you take, if you cut it down and say, let's talk to Canadians about, about transit what we're specifically, which about is six billion dollars over the next four years, which is more money than the NDP. Where's and, the and money coming from? you are financing these things because you have not been clear about the involvement of banks, about pension plans, about P3s, and so on and so forth. We're making it simple for cities. Steady, predictable stream coming from the federal government to municipalities to be spent on infrastructure and transit as per their But it's priorities. our tax money. Dollars. We're paying for it. Six billion dollars go to public <laughs> transit. Six billion dollars goes to uh, social infrastructure, which is affordable That's housing, seniors facilities, and childcare spaces. And six billion dollars goes to well, green infrastructure. Six billion dollars specifically for public transit. I'm not throwing over, everything over, into that bucket. Over it's what all term? for public over transit. Over term? four years, Mr. Kelly. Four and years is not enough. And if you go and, and, and an I, I did the consultation. I did the consultation with urban. I did the consultation with urban transit authorities, idea. large cities, small cities, <laughs> and what they all say is that you need a ramp up to predictable funding. Four years is not enough. Yeah. They of need course, to know it's exactly out 20 right. years, and if you know, not you know in the, perpetuity. You know not what four the main years. The problem is, is the lack of stable funding for our municipalities. Absolutely. Right? 
they, they really only have two forms or streams of revenue, right, which is property tax and fines. So uh, unlike U.S. cities that get part of the tax base, right? So the Greens would take 1% of the GST and that would be a dedicated infrastructure mm -hmm. fund for the cities. What the cities need is two things. They need funding now to uh, repair the crumbling infrastructure and build more of it, and they need steady funding going forward. So we are looking at ways of providing that, uh, that steady funding, and that's just one. Roger. Take, take money out of the foreign bank accounts and bring it back to Canada they where it belongs. I agree. I, agree. I mean, that that's, that, that's, uh, that's what we should do, because I think it's crime to take out of money, to take money which has been earned in Canada, which properly belongs in Canada, take it back from Switzerland, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, and other so-called tax havens which uh, I think is, uh, well, an absolute mistake because the corporations don't pay their fair share of taxes in the first place. And all that money could go into the infrastructure that we need. And, uh, you know, let the people decide, you know, where the money should go, where it, where it should go most importantly. But once again, you know, the people are left out of the decision making and that in itself is a big crime. So we need a new constitution to allow that to happen too. New constitution, a new I constitution, agree. that's yes. no small feat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely we not. We a new constitution party, I think. No well, that, that's part <laughs> of our program. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I just want to ask uh, my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Erskine Smith here, uh, you're suggesting doubling the investment that we've made in infrastructure programs, yet your party has still not um, said whether or not they're going to support smart tracks. Can you tell me with all this extra money why they can't find money for smart tracks and why a plan that's been endorsed by pretty much everyone in the GTA and that's that's uh, something that everyone in the GTA is looking forward to. It's the fastest way to get public infrastructure up and running so that people can, can reduce gridlock. Can you tell me why your party isn't indicating whether they're going to support it or not? This is not about us deciding to support Smart SmartTrack or not. This is about us being a strong federal partner with the city, and if the city wants to spend their money on smart track, they will spend their money on smart track. I think track. they've made that, it pretty uh, clear. Th then then so great, then that's where the money will go. That's John Tory's decision and the city council's decision. The so money from us will be there. that your party is going to be supporting smart track. We will be supporting the city of Toronto and the decision that they make, and if that's smart track, then great. And, and just on the stable funding, so we are proposing major investments over four years, our first mandate. We are proposing additional major monies over the next uh, 10 years in, in the event that there's a longer mandate and the nice thing is and this is going to Randall's point about stable funding where money is not allocated to a particular project in a given year it gets rolled into the gas tax transfer so that the cities get it no matter what we are not going to play politics with it the money is going to infrastructure Bill in the last budget the conservative government announced a new transit fund but it's a billion dollars a year when fully ramped up by 2019, and many are saying that's not nearly enough. How would your party adequately fund transit? Well, I've already mentioned the investments that we've announced already. $13 billion in infrastructure programs here in Ontario, $2.6 billion of that additional money for uh, smart tracks as well. I think that the commitment of the Conservative government to provide investment in infrastructure, in um, roads and, and those types of projects are pretty clear and as I mentioned earlier we're doing that with a balanced budget and without raising people's taxes and I think that the other parties over here continue to talk about all these promises that they're making and they don't clarify for the voters that all of their plans are very nebulous when it comes to how they're going to pay for them and who's going to pay for them and I don't know if I'm going to agree on with a lot of the things that James Sears has to say, but that's one thing that I do agree. This has to be paid for by somebody and who's going to pay for it. Our plan has been very clear, very transparent, and we've told the voters that their taxes are not going to go up and we're going to provide them with a balanced budget. How are you going to pay back the deficit that your party wants to enact to pay for these promises when it comes to transit and infrastructure? So the fact of the matter is that the infrastructure deficit costs the economy a lot of money. 
that the return on investment we will get from spending on infrastructure more than exceeds the small borrowing costs. You have organizations that are not particularly left-leaning, like the IMF, saying we need, in the Western world, where we have major infrastructure deficits, to we have a unique opportunity to clear out the infrastructure deficit. That's the deficit we should be worried about. And we have a plan which is fully costed, which it ha has the support of any number of economists, including uh, the former parliamentary budget officer, uh, that uh, over the next two years, it'll be a slightly less than $10 billion deficit. G debt to GDP ratio will continue to go down, and we will come into balance in 2019. And on a going well, forward... Yeah, we, we need to talk about how they come into balance in 2019. It's with $6.5 billion worth of cuts. And I want to that know is where not those. True. I want to know where those cuts are coming from. That's in your fiscal framework. You're going to run a deficit for three years, and then you've promised Canadians 6.5 billion dollars of cuts. And where we're at then is the same long-held tradition that both of these parties have of lurching from deficit to deficit to deficit to cuts. And when is some party going to come forward and say, look, we need real lasting change based on a, f a fiscally sustainable plan that will allow us to have predictable funding for but cities, predictable funding time, for but, but some very key national programs that we need, like mm -hmm. child care, like pharmacare, and that's what our plan is. But the it's, IMF, it is fiscal the IMF sustainability is in the to real lasting change. The IMF is in the pocket of the World Banks. The IMF, of course, supports us spending money. Because the IMF wants us to owe money to uh, sleazy world bankers, and then all our taxes go up to pay for these infrastructure projects. We should be printing our own money. It all, all the deficits started in 1974 when we lost control of our bank. Just remember that. And Roger. The, I'm going to let Roger get a word okay. in. There. Yes, okay. Nationalize the banks. Put the banks under the control of the people of Canada where it properly belongs. So let the people decide where the money earned in Canada by the people of Canada. Let them decide where the money should go. So nationalize the, the banks of Canada. Put, put them under the con control of the people uh, of Canada. I, I'm going to switch just, it slightly, if I can, and, say, and get back to the topic that we're talking about, actually, um, which is I think it's time that we treat the municipalities as an important par partners in our confederation. Right? As, as important as the provinces, and we don't. They are the they're poor cousin of our, of our federation, and that needs to change. So um, I have a lot of ideas to change that, but one is to provide stable funding, as I said. So I think we need to really look at the funding source of municipalities and, and give them a system that works, give them funding that works for them so that they can provide the social housing that's been downloaded by the former li Liberal government. Um, they can fix the infrastructure that comes from the lack of money from the federal government. And it's really sad that we have a prime minister that won't even talk to the provinces as a group and certainly has no intention of talking to municipalities as a group. Bill, I'm going to let open. you have the last I, word on my, this one. My, my only comment about the deficits, and we've heard the Liberals tell us over and over and over that they have no problems going into huge deficits, running huge deficits. And I hear my colleague over here constantly mentioning the fact that interest rates are low and this is the best time to borrow. But just like everybody else at home that has to make a decision on a mortgage and other borrowing costs, everybody has to ask the question, what happens if and when interest rates go up? And that's where deficits are going to have a huge impact and where taxes and things go out of control. And that's why the issue of maintaining a balanced budget and keeping deficits at a minimum are so important. And that's why voters need to understand that because at the end of the day, you're the ones that pay for that. All right, gentlemen, we're going to move on to our next question. Toward the end of the summer, we were all devastated to see that photograph of the young Syrian boy drowned on the beach. It raised many questions about our role in Canada and the immigrants that we want to bring in. Canada has long been known as the welcomer for immigrants and refugees and a peacekeeper around the world. The current government has committed to resettling 10,000 Syrians by September 2016 as well as resettling 23,000 Iraqi refugees. At the same time, we also accept 250,000 immigrants to this country every year, which is the highest intake per capita in the world. If your, your party is elected, what are your proposals on dealing with the Syrian refugee crisis and immigration? Matthew, I'll start with you, and then we'll go this way and end with Bill. 
30 seconds. Sure, great. Our commitment uh, to the Syrian refugees is to do as the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency has asked. We will bring in 10,000 government-sponsored refugees by the end of the year, and over the term of our mandate, 46,000 government-sponsored refugees, along with uh, uncapped, fast-tracked uh, number of refugees that we will bring in. Broadly on the uh, immigration issue, uh, we understand in Canada that for fiscal sustainability of all the things we care about, pensions, universal health care, we need a minimum amount of immigration into this country. That's we will time. privilege family reunification. Nathaniel. So we will immediately resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees. Uh, Rick Hillier, former Chief of Defense Staff, has said it could be as high as 50,000 that we could reasonably uh, bring into Canada. Uh, we're going to bring in 25,000 immediately and then reassess the situation and see what else we can do. And that is immediately the crisis is now. Uh, as far as family reunification is concerned, I agree with my friend, Mr. Kelway. We, ne we, we, need to, uh, we need to focus on that. We are doubling the resources to increase uh, uh, processing times, uh, to speed up processing times. It's, it's been a... That's time. Sure. Randall. Yeah. Um, the first thing we would do is stop the bombing because when you bomb people, they move. Right? So regardless of what Mr. Harper says, bombing so you know ISIS in isolation is not going to solve the problem. And ISIS is just one faction, right? So you have to take a larger regional view, but this is a crisis. We have over five million people that are now in refugee camps in, in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and we're not dealing with it. Um, we, we need to do something quickly, and as Nathaniel says, Rick Hillier, former Chief of Defense Staff, says we can do this. I know M Rick I'm Hillier, I met him when I was up. in Afghanistan, and I believe him. Time's up. Thank you. Roger. Okay, uh, get out of all foreign civil wars, uh, like we've got no business being there anyway, but Canada is one thirteenth of the surface of the earth. We've only got 34 million people here. Do we need refugees? Do we need immigrants? Do we need migrants? Do we need more? people well hell yes obviously so uh, yeah that that's that's my attitude towards that but don't make refugees by blundering around in civil wars in foreign countries that is just insane to say the least James the war in Syria is a war to expand Israel ISIS stands for Israeli secret intelligence service you can google it there's a video from years ago where a reporter actually brought this up. As far as that little Syrian boy, his father was a human smuggler who was piloting that ship. The father, to show the ship was safe, he, was, he charged $10,000 a head, said, I'll even bring my own children on the ship. The Canadian media didn't report it, but the Australian media did because our media is Zion Marxist control. And that's time, Bill. Cynthia, as I've mentioned to so many folks um, at the door, I'm an immigrant to Canada. My wife is an immigrant to Canada. We both come from countries that have uh, had a lot of political unrest. We've both seen it with our own eyes. We know and we sympathize uh, with the folks that are coming from Syria. Um, and, you know, the, the approaches you mentioned earlier, per capita, we've done more than any other G7 country, and that's a fact. And we're, we're pledging to do, to, to do as much as we can. Uh, but, you know, our government's approach is also to help solve the problem at the source. And we can get That's into that time, further. That's time, Bill. I'm going to open up the floor now. I agree with the Marxist guy and the Green guy. We should stop murdering people in foreign countries. We're creating the refugees, and we're doing it to help Israel expand. And it's wrong. It's immoral. It's, like, I don't, I don't know what's happened to Canada. Like, like Canada used to be the peacemaker. Right? And I think the Green and, and, and the Marxist guy will agree with me. We were the peacemaker at one time. I, the days of Lester Pearson was a liberal. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. But um, <laughs> Nathan, I'm cool with that. But we were the peacemaker. Now, we're just Israel and the United States, I don't know, uh, can I say bitch on TV? I don't know. But that's what we are. We do whatever they tell us, and we're murdering these people. And then we're told to bring them over here. It's wrong, absolutely wrong. And I'm going to say no, no swearing here. Okay. Thank you. Gentlemen? So uh, this is not a, a place where we're going to attack one another. This is a, a place where we, we do need multi-partisan, you know, we, this should not be partisan. We should be working together uh, to bring as many Syrian refugees over as we possibly can, put politics aside to do that. And, uh, you know, it's not just, uh, it's not just about uh, doing the right thing. It, you know, it is about restoring Canada's place in the world, being a real world player. Um, and, uh, and taking a role on the world stage that we haven't taken in the last nine years. 
Canada's involvement in the bombing missions is doing absolutely nothing. Uh, so we need to stop that as soon as possible and return to our traditional role as peacekeepers and as people that lead by example. We're following an example. It's not our example, it's the American example and we need to stop that. Well, it's not just doing nothing, Randall. It's actually killing people. And, and we have a government now that's so twisted in its thinking that, that it responds to this crisis involving 4.5 million people by saying that they can save more lives by bombing lives. And this is what it's come to. And, and being the 13th or 14th country in with six CF-18s at a cost of 500 million, there is so much more that Canada should be doing here uh, with that money in the form of humanitarian aid in that part of the world. We can actually be saving lives in a very significant way and um, it would be good for Canada to return to a place on the international stage of a, a country that is about peace and it's about humanitarian aid. I, Bill, I'd would you like to defend agree. your... your, get, get your out of NATO like and I'm, 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 I'm just going to ask Bill a question Mr. for a moment. Would you okay. like okay. to defend Thank your you. party's <laughs> stance on this issue? Well, as I said before, we've taken a balanced approach. We've, uh, we've pledged no. more aid. We've, we've um, uh, opened the door to more Syrians than any other G7 country per capita in the world. We've also taken a role along with our allies and along with all of our partners around the world. And uh, we've, we've undertaken in, in bombing missions against ISIS. And I've said it before, and Prime Minister Harper said it as well, we're not going to apologize for bombing people that run around and chop people's heads off. So the thing is that I'm sorry to be so, so frank about it, but the reality is that we're not bombing school children, folks. We're, we're bombing the enemy. We're, bon we're bombing s ISIS. We are, we and are those are people children, that have yes. declared war against Canada. No, they didn't. Well, if you feel so, that way, why don't you do something about Bashar al-Assad, who's dropping barrel bombs on people? Mr. Harper used to hate Bashar al-Assad. Since he joined the bombing mission, he never mentions his name. So if you want to deal with people that are killing people, why don't you deal with the person that started the problem in the first place? Why don't we look after our own people at home? Yeah. How about and, that? and this isn't just about... We should get out, out of civil wars in foreign countries, which we know agreed. nothing about, basically, anyway. And we should also get out of NATO and NORAD. Bring all our troops home, let them work in Canada, because there's more than enough work for them to do right here in Canada. Agreed. But, I mean, a civil war in a foreign country, one person says one thing, another person says another. Who are you going to listen? to like we're just a bunch of uh, well uninformed Canadians so what are we going to contribute there so get out of these foreign countries where there's civil wars come back home and uh, put our own house in yeah. order I've it's in Russia's backyard three times Bill three different debates I've asked you why doesn't Mr. Harper mention Bashar al-Assad so maybe on television you can explain it to us Bill I ISIS is evil ISIS is evil we can agree on that the question is how does one deal with ISIS and there is no evidence that the airstrikes have been effective. There is no strike, there is no evidence that we have a clear objective. We have a clear mission to end the airstrikes and when they will end. We, if we wanna be part of, of the world, we, we're going to be a part of it uh, in a multilateral way, partnering through NATO, partnering through the United Nations, and we need a clear plan. And so if, then are if you suggesting that you're going to support the NATO and, and allied request for us to continue bombing? If there is a, if there is a NATO mission and there's a clear which uh, there is and there's no. a clear there's a clear Sorry. cost there's which, a clear objective which it, there is. and it, it, it could be reasonably success, successful th then yes we no, will so consider that. So they do support bombing ISIS. It's not have you mission. guys looked it at the news? You no, know, have you guys looked at the news? We haven't been bombing ISIS. The first people to bomb ISIS was Putin a few days ago, and four hundred and fifty four hundred and fifty ISIS fighters defected in the last 24 hours. I've, uh, you guys are watching the mainstream media here on TV where we're brainwashed. Go and do your research. 450 ISIS fighters defected. They're like real bombs are dropping on us now. And Putin's bombing the crap out of them. See, I didn't swear. He's bombing the crap out of them. That's, that's what he's doing. Just, yeah. Fundamentally, Cynthia, we need a new defense policy for this country. We, we have a defense policy under the conservatives that has us being all things to all people around the world, and we end up sending young men and women in our armed forces around the world to protect rights and freedoms and extend the rule of law to other jurisdictions, and yet we have a government here in our own country that has taken those constitutional protections away from its own citizens, aided and abetted by the liberals, and I'm referring to C-51. It embeds into our own laws and 
Canada, this terrible suspicion that the Conservatives have about the motives of human conduct. And in addition to that, with C24, it causes real problems. It marginalizes and stigmatizes communities in this country and causes uh, a real sense of threat uh, to, to people in our community in Beaches, East York. Uh, and uh, our pledge is to repeal C C51 and C24 and uh, restore constitutional protections for everybody in Canada. We have had, in, in the course of this election, we have been faced with uh, uh, NDP supporters knocking on doors in Beaches East York and telling people that the Liberal Party supported C51 and supported C24. It's absolutely incorrect. We are that going to repeal. True. It, that is not true. We, we have well, heard this, at, we have heard this at the door, Mr. Calway. You better be able to substantiate it. You're going on TV, Nathaniel. You better be able to substantiate it. We have absolutely heard this at the door. We have heard this everywhere in Crescent Town. The Liberal Party is going to repeal C24. We are absolutely going to repeal C24, and we are going to fix C51. There are major problems with C51. We've proposed major amendments, and we are going to fix this bill. And simply repealing you it stood ignores up at the church debate and said that you actually agreed with parts of Bill yeah. C24. Yes, you're running. You run and and furthermore, C51 if anyone's bill. running around C51 the riding, bill. telling people things yeah. that are not true. Primarily in Crescent Town, sir, it's your party. Yeah, you okay? run against You're your running own around party all the time. All the time. C51, Justin Trudeau has specifically come out and said. Proportional representation on and on. You run against your Justin own party. Justin Trudeau himself has said picking sides has been problematic. You guys are the ones running around. C24, you guys are the ones repeal. running around Crescent Town, debates, telling people things that are absolutely incorrect about B Bill C24, and we're going there to correct the record. Because you folks are the ones, not the NDP. C24, which creates dual citizenship. Listen, you know what? You know we what will your repeal guys it. are telling people? Because I've heard it at the door from a number of people. And we're making an honest effort to go out there and what make sure we, we correct the record. About C24 that You're is telling people that it, cr it creates a two-tier two system and that all those folks over it there are going to lose their passports, which is totally wrong. And you're the one that's scaring people, not us, not them. I think all dual yeah. citizens in Canada should so be afraid of So thank you for that opportunity to correct the record. I really think all dual citizens in Canada should be very afraid of Bill C-24. I'm a dual citizen, too. Yeah, and you should okay? be afraid, too, I Bill. I came into Canada as an immigrant. Because it's much wider than terrorism. I have nothing to terrorism. be afraid of, and I have nothing to be worried about. It's much I don't wider than terrorism. You don't have anything to be worried about because you're a conservative. Crimes, you're and as long as I don't commit why. those crimes, I have nothing to worry about, sir. So, uh, interfering with the government of Canada by protesting pipelines That's would be illegal. That's absolutely ridiculous. Would if, be if illegal. If that's the case, people would be getting arrested every day, and that's not true. People are getting arrested. Under those terms. And they'd be losing their passports, according to you and my friend. You know what they're Nathaniel doing? They're, they're, they're defending audits by CRA with the Our money that the, that the government gave them to. Our bill is constitutional, and it will stand up in court, and you'll see that. I, th I think what we need so to, to have, Cynthia, the environmentalists. Is, is politicians uh, who, who politic honestly. I mean... Uh, Nathaniel came to my office to lobby me in, in support of proportional representation Absolutely. as when he was running as a candidate for the Liberal Party. My party has had that as its policy since Ed Broadbent's days. Nathaniel's leader is explicitly against proportional representation. And so, Nathaniel, you've got to stop running against your own party. I'm you not speak, running against my own party. Stephanie on Dion and on, supports on, on representation. I don't care what's the... Your leader, your leader has said no, and your leader stood up in, in the no. House and voted against proportional representation in December, <laughs> as did half your caucus. He is on record of say, as saying he does not believe in proportional representation. He has a different electoral system that he would like to pursue. Same with if, C-51. If, if you run against against your own party on C-51, your caucus all stood in support of C-51 every time it came up in the House. You aided and abetted that law into being in this country, embedding suspicion into the laws of Canada, taking away rights and freedoms of Canadians. You have to own up to that, Nathaniel, because that is your party's position. You supported it. So Two things, and, and first I'll say Trudeau has committed to freer votes in the House of Commons, no. and, and that's why I got involved in politics. Seriously? Yes, seriously. It's incredibly yeah. important that we have bottom-up democracy. Thomas Mulcair has whipped every single vote since becoming leader of the NDP. Nothing, this is why Bruce Hires left. You what happens in behind caucus doors. And stop <laughs> pretending that if you I, do. If I may, Mr. Cowley, okay? I have two responses. You have no idea what may. it is if to be in our caucus room, and you have no idea what it is to be in a liberal caucus if room. May, so Mr. stop Cowley. pretending, Nathaniel, uh, if, that you know what happens and that you know what your leader does and says 
if, behind a caucus if, room. If I and may. I will tell you about whipping votes when we get an opportunity because it is just based on uh, stereotypes and misinformation. If, if, I, if I may. Yeah, you go ahead, but on, on, speak on about proportional things you know, on, Nathaniel. On proportional representation, Mr. Kelway, we have been clear we are going to end first past the post and with 18, within 18 months of forming government, we are going to have a national consultation and within 18 months of forming government, we are going to, we are going to select an answer. It is not predetermined as it should not be predetermined. I, I, I can say I favor proportional representation, but Canadians have to agree on such a major change and it's a conversation that we need to have as Canadians. Okay, I'm stopping you there. Yeah, we have 15 right. seconds left before closing. Roger has been begging me for something to say. I give you okay. 10 seconds to close this off. Okay, no election without selection and instant recall. Like the laws and the proposals, like if they don't originate from the people, they're flawed right from the beginning. All right, so, thank you very so much. We it. have to move on to closing statements. Believe it or not, we've wrapped up the debate order. portion and uh, this will be done in reverse order of opening statements. So James, I am going to start with you. As far as I'm concerned, I won this debate. At least to my, <laughs> at least to my base. Now, so I, I've got a great new slogan. You've been waiting all these years to vote Sears. For God's sake, don't screw it up. Okay? I want you to vote for me, James Sears. Go to jamessears.ca. That's Sears like the store. You can read all about me. I'm the only person on the stage that has a concise platform created by me, not some stuffed shirt in some back room. Time's James up. Sears. Roger Carter, you're next. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, using war to stimulate the economy doesn't work. I mean, it's not 1930 anymore, and also, uh, you know, like uh, sending uh, troops into a foreign civil war to assist uh, them to use weapons, like in the Ukraine, for example, to get West Ukrainians to shoot East Ukrainians. That's going to embroil Canada in a civil war in a foreign country. You should, you should not be there. But to do not use war to stimulate the economy. It Thank doesn't you. work. Thank you. Randall never Seth, did. you're next. So the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the horse and buggy age didn't end because we ran out of horses or buggies. They ended because people found new technologies to move to. And we're at that point right now. We have these technologies. We can move to 100% renewables now. The storage problems with solar have been solved by Elon Musk, among other people. So we can do it. The technology is there. We just have the will to we need the will to do it. So that's that's my message to you. Be bold. Vote green. Thank you. Nathaniel Erskine Smith. Uh, so I'm a happy candidate. We, we have a plan to tackle climate change. We have a plan to bring kids out of poverty. We, we have a plan. We have a plan to do so many things for veterans and First Nations. Uh, I encourage you all to read all about it. Uh, but honesty in politics is so important and an honest representation of one's community. I knocked on doors. I heard all sorts of concerns about C-51. I have concerns about C-51 and, and I've stood up publicly and said so. That is perfectly okay. It is encouraged by my party. Respectful disagreement is encouraged my, by my party. You should not point fingers at us and say you can't disagree with your own party. Thank you. That's, how, that's what democracy is Matthew supposed Kelly. to be. Thank you, Cynthia. Politics is about putting yourself in the service of others' needs and ambitions, not pursuing your own. A politician's agenda ought to come from the community, and you learn it by being of service to the community, the whole community. I've lived in this riding for 20 years. I've raised my three kids in this riding. I have carried your needs and ambitions into the House of Commons, and I look forward to continuing to do so until they're met. Bill Burroughs. I believe that the role of, of your local MP is to protect, um, uh, to, to bring benefits to, to my own riding and to fight for the things that, mo that matter most to people like you and me. Things like safer streets for our kids in our community, infrastructure renewal, taking care of our seniors and creating new job opportunities in Beaches East York. I'll fight to protect income splitting for seniors and families, to protect your tax-free savings account, to fight for lower taxes for families and for small business, and to keep the universal child care benefit that so many families have come to, uh, to rely on. And, and that that's time. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much, gentlemen, for joining us this evening. And that is it for the local campaign. Airtimes for other debates can be found on rogerstv.com. I'm Cynthia Mulligan. Goodbye for now.